Part 1 You will hear a man talking to a receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good evening, sir. Do you have a reservation? Yes. Let me just check I've got everything. Um, uh, sorry. Yes, a reservation. It's in the name of Hartley. Martin Hartley. Let me see. Oh, yes. Here it is. That's for three nights. Yes, that's right. Do you need my passport? I just need to take the number as a form of ID. No problem. Now, can I just ask you to fill in this registration form, please? Ah, actually, no. You see, I've broken my wrist. Yes, I noticed that. I'm afraid form filling is something I can't manage right now. Not without a lot of pain, anyway. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm sorry, sir. But don't worry. I can complete the form for you. That's very kind of you. What do you need to know? Well, let's start with your name, of course. So that's Martin... Um... Hartley. That's H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. Thanks. And your address? 45... Carlisle Way. Could you spell Carlisle for me? Sorry. It's C-A-R-L-I-S-L-E. You don't pronounce the S. <laughs> Carlisle Way. And that's in Lewis. L-E-W-E-S. And is there a state... I don't think you have states in the UK. No, we have counties. It's East Sussex. Sussex is with double S. The postcode is LW46AU. Do you want my phone number? Actually, no. We contact people by email now. Ah, yes. And send me lots of advertising, too, I suppose. <laughs> My email is hartleynitrum at yahoo.co.uk. Sorry, a bit slower, please. Hartley, my surname, then Martin backwards, N-I-T-R-A-M. That's all one word. And all lowercase? That's right. No capitals. At yahoo.co.uk Thank you very much, Mr Hartley. And could you give me your passport now, please? Thanks. You can have that back now. Ah. And that's for three nights, so checking out on Sunday morning? Uh-huh. OK. You're in room 16. That's on the first floor, overlooking the courtyard. Here's your key. Would you like somebody to take your bag? Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Do you have a map I can take? Yes, of course. We've usually got lots of them here. Somewhere. Ah, yes. Here we are. Thanks. Could you show me where we are, exactly? Um, let me have a look. Um, ah, 
Yes, this is our street here, Avenida Constitución. The bigger hotels are marked, so let me just see which one is us. Um, here, yes, here. This is Hotel Columbus, just before you get to the museum. I say just before because that's the way most people get here. I mean, coming from the main square where all the buses stop, or from the station. Yes. That's the way the taxi came in from the airport. I thought we drove past the museum, though, just after we went through that big square you mentioned. Ah, you probably mean here. That's actually an art gallery. It's worth having a look round, but the museum's more interesting. I think so, anyway. Thanks for the tip. I hope I get time. Right. Well, tomorrow I've got to be at the conference centre. They told me they'd put me in a hotel that wasn't too far away. Oh yes, the conference centre's not too far at all. Let me see. Ah,、uh, yes, down here. You can walk there in seven or eight minutes. Just cross over the road and go straight down this street here. That will take you towards the newer part of the city. Walk on for a couple of blocks, and then when you get here, you just have to go right a very short distance. And then you'll see the conference center above the other buildings. It's quite big. I see. That all looks quite straightforward. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Have a nice evening, sir. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman talking about health and safety when using a computer. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session on health and safety. And today we're focusing on health and safety when using a computer. Now, can you all gather round this workstation here? That's great. Thanks. Okay, now. Let's look at some equipment that is specifically designed for safe computer use. Firstly, take a look at this item here. Yes, the sloped slab in front of the keyboard. Does anyone know what it is? That's right. It's a wrist rest, and it does a lot more than take up room on your desk. I can tell you. <laughs> well. What does it do exactly? In actual fact, it's specifically designed to support your wrist when you're typing or when you're using a computer mouse. Now, the one I'm holding in my hand is made of foam rubber. Come on now, have a feel. You know you want to. Now, it's very flexible, isn't it? The padding is firm. But it also gives way when you press it, just like this. Here's another type, by the way. This one is filled with gel. Now, like the foam rubber type, it's got a firm surface. But when you press it like this, it gives way with a little spring. However, 
Not all wrist rests are flexible like that. Some are made from hard plastic. That doesn't sound like a comfortable support for your wrist, does it? So, not to be recommended. Okay. So we know what kind of material we're looking for in a wrist rest, but what else do we have to think about before we choose one? Now look again at the foam rubber wrist rest here. You can see that the slope of the wrist rest and the height and the width too match the front edge of the keyboard here, and there are no sharp edges. Look. It's really nice and smooth. Now we know it's a busy time for you all at the moment. You're busy with assignments in between the hours you're spending browsing the net and going on social networking sites. <laughs> well, just think about how hard your wrist has to work. So using a wrist rest like this one can really help in a number of ways. First of all. It helps you keep your wrist straight when you're using your computer. I'm demonstrating this now. As you can see, my wrist is neutral and straight, rather than bent up and down. See what I mean? Now, it can also provide padding for your hands. It works in much the same way as a cushion, so it makes your desk much more comfortable. Now, please note. I did say cushion rather than pillow. We don't want you students to be too comfortable. Another advantage of a wrist rest is that it stops your hands from dropping off the edge of the keyboard. A wrist rest can also relieve tension and soreness in your neck and shoulders. And how does it do that exactly? Well. It removes the weight of your arm from your shoulders and neck altogether, so there are a lot of benefits, aren't there? However, most people never learn how to use a wrist rest correctly. In fact, leaning your wrists on a wrist rest for long periods can put a lot of pressure on the undersides of your wrists. Just here. Now you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the talk, and answer questions eighteen to twenty. So, to make the most of your wrist rest, it's really important to follow a few basic tips. First of all, make sure you place your wrist rest approximately one and a half inches away from your keyboard, like this. And never ever place your wrists directly on your wrist rest. Instead, place the palm or ball of your hand on the rest. And another thing, don't use the wrist rest all the time, particularly when you're typing. Instead, your hands should be on the wrist rests during break periods, so between your typing sessions. This will avoid you putting strain on your wrists and fingers. Now, does anyone have any questions before we move on to computer glasses? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3. You will hear two students talking about reading. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Milena. How's your research for your assignment going? Which assignment, Josh? The one on sustainable transport. It's due in on Friday. Oh, I've not nearly finished it. I've still got so many articles to get through. In fact... I need to read another two books on the reading list before I can even think about writing it up. It doesn't help that I'm a really slow reader. Well, why don't you practice speed reading, just like me? Oh, let me into your secret. If anything, if I don't get a move on, my assignment is going to be late. What exactly is speed reading, anyway? Well, speed reading basically means reading faster and more efficiently. It can make such a difference. I've noticed the benefits already, and I've only been doing it a few weeks. Sounds good. What benefits are we talking exactly? Well, the majority of people read at an average rate of 250 words a minute. So that means that an average page in a book or document would take you around one or two minutes to read. So up to two minutes a page? That sounds quite fast to me. I reckon I spend at least five minutes on each one. But just think about it. Imagine if you could double that rate to 500 words a minute. You could zip through all the articles and books in half the time. Another thing is that it can help you understand the basic structure of an idea or an argument much better. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 25 to 30. You make speed reading sound like some kind of sport. Well, actually, speed reading is a bit like playing sport. I like to think it's similar to running. Running? Much too fast for me. I'm more of a jogger. You're not selling it to me very well. OK, OK, but just think about what it takes to be a fast runner. You can learn the techniques, but to get really good at it and build up your speed, you really need to practice. But athletes train for hours every day. That's true, but your reading speed can improve if you practice a few basic techniques. The first thing to do is to actually find out how fast you're reading at the moment. So, time my current reading speed. But I read so slowly, it will be really depressing to find out just how slow I am. Believe me, timing yourself is a really good idea and it's so easy to do. There are lots of online speed reading tests. You just enter the words reading speed test into Google and loads will come up. You could also do a reading comprehension test and see how well you understand what you're reading. I don't know. But remember to read at your normal speed and time yourself on a few different pages. The average of your times should indicate your average reading speed. What do I do next? Well, the next thing to do, and this is really important, is to get rid of distractions. I used to think that music in the background while I was reading was a good thing, but it wasn't for me. I found I increased my speed by working without any noise whatsoever. I usually read in the library, but there always seem to be people talking around me. Well, try using earplugs to block out all the distractions. Another important thing is to set yourself targets. Basically, if you know what your goal is, you're more likely to achieve it. My goal? Well, that's easy. I need to find out about the problems of accessible transport in Africa 
and then think about some solutions. I know what I need to do, but I keep skipping back to a sentence I've just read, and at other times I go back a few pages just to make sure that I've read something right. I know what you mean. Actually, a lot of people do that when they read. They reread material when they don't actually need to. It's called regression, and it's important to get out of the habit of doing it. You can reduce the number of times your eyes skip back by running your finger or a pencil along each line you read. Your eyes will follow the tip of your finger, and this helps you avoid skipping back. Why not give it a try? Yes, I think I'll give it a go. But I suppose the first thing to do is find out what my reading speed is. What a thought! That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about animals. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully to the lecture, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about avoiding predation. What does that mean? I hear you say. Well, you probably know the word predator. I'm sure you've all seen Predator the movie. Well, a predator is any animal that hunts and kills another animal. That animal. And I was going to say that smaller animal, but it's not always the case. Is the prey? An owl, for example, is a predator, and a mouse is its prey. A lion is a predator, and a much bigger animal, a buffalo, for example, is its prey. So when I say avoiding predation, what I mean is not being caught and eaten. For many small animals. Not being caught and eaten is pretty much a full-time job. Many animals that are predators themselves may be the prey of another, usually bigger animal. This is what we popularly call the food chain. So, how do animals avoid predation? Well, they have what we call defense mechanisms. These are ways in which the species has adapted over time. To give it an advantage over its predators, any adaptation of this kind increases the species' chances of survival. Over time, species that have not adapted, that is, developed some sort of defense mechanism, have met with extinction. There are various forms of defense. The first is probably very obvious. And that's speed. Predators can't feed on what they can't catch. Running away is a very effective defense mechanism, as some of you can probably remember from primary school. Flight is even more effective. Species which have developed the ability to fly over time have an enormous advantage. Far more birds would be a meal out in the wild if they couldn't fly. The second mechanism is protective coloration. You might hear the word camouflage used too, but I personally find that too simple a term when it comes to the animal kingdom. 
Protective coloration includes a number of slightly varied mechanisms within the overall term. Some animals blend in with their background. A chameleon is a good example. It sits on a tree, and it looks like the branch of that tree. Butterflies have what we think of as beautiful patterns, not to be beautiful, but to confuse and warn off potential assailants. They blend in with the flowers around them, but may also look like something else. Some butterflies have patterns that look like huge eyes, and a would-be predator is scared off. There are all sorts of stories about how the zebra got its stripes, and not many people really know what the stripes are there for. Well, that type of coloration is called dazzle camouflage. A zebra stands out when alone and stationary, but when zebras move rapidly in a herd, their stripes create motion dazzle, a confusing flickering mass to the eye of a lion or cheetah that might be giving chase. Selecting a target becomes far more difficult. Now, of course, animals are caught; they're frequently caught, but that might not mean the game's up. Some animals make themselves difficult or horrible to eat. Hedgehogs have sharp spines that deter a predator from tucking in, even when it's captured its prey. The predator is very likely to give up when a spine gouges an eye or gets lodged in its throat. Numerous species of creature, turtles or snails, for example, have developed a tough outer shell that makes it almost impossible to devour. One of my favorite creatures is the skunk, which emits a repulsive smell on being cornered, enough to send any attacker herring back into the undergrowth. In a similar way, some sea-dwelling mollusks can emit an ink cloud that fills the surrounding water, concealing it from a predatory fish that may be circling. There are frogs that go one step further; they're so poisonous. That even if a predator does try and eat them, it'll probably keel over and drop dead first. Now you'll probably be surprised, but I'm going to go on to talk about plants. Yes, many plants have defense mechanisms in exactly the same way as animals. You've probably all been stung by a nettle at some time. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.